Um, so thank you to the organisers for inviting me. Um, my background is only incidentally in biofouling um, through this project. So over the last couple of days, um, I've actually learned an enormous amount. I've really enjoyed the, um, the, the other speakers so far and many of the conversations that I've had um, over the last couple of days. Um, so what I'd like to talk to you about today um, is something which actually relates quite well to the previous two talks. Um, we've come up with a, a new product for marine anti-fouling and the project um, is currently in commercialisation and the name of the project is Suricle. So originally this project um, has been around for, in some form, for about 10 years or so. It was originally part of um, Wealth from Oceans. Um, and at that time, we were actually working with uh, the University of Southern Queensland with um, Rocky Denise, looking at texturing um, and how we could um, have... Oh, oh. sorry. <laughs> um, and how we might actually be able to uh, avoid, uh, avoid biofouling through um, micro-texturing. Um, and so uh, my colleague, Andrew Poole, who's a uh, microbiologist, um, he was working on that project for a number of years. And at one of our internal CSRO conferences, he actually came across um, an, another member of our team now, Peter King, who was actually working in cold spray additive manufacturing. And the two of them got together and had some conversations to see whether they could um, actually use cold spray as a method for creating um, mic micro textured surfaces. And what we actually found was that um, the embedment of uh, various metals was actually more effective than the micro-texturing. And so the project went along those lines. Um, so what we've, uh, you know, come up with is that uh, uh, the, the, the problem that we were trying to solve at the time was that uh, in the uh, energy sector for marine seismic um, surveys, one of the problems is that uh, while ablative, you know, copper paints are, are, are good for um, rigid surfaces, they're not very good for um, plastic or flexible surfaces. And so um, the marine, the, the seismic industry had a problem in that some of these ships actually tow up to 80 or 100 kilometres worth of um, seismic streamers. And these are sort of... Uh, uh, sensors which are coated with a, um, a, a polyurethane um, sort of uh, sheath and so uh, they can get uh, biofouled, particularly um, barnacle strike and what happens is that you get um, very uh, large hydrodynamic drag, um, the streamers can break, they can weigh down in the water and that can also create a lot of noise um, in the signal. So the real um, background of the project was to try and help the seismic industry. Um, and so when Peter and Andrew got together and looked at these, uh, you know, the problem and the technique that uh, Peter was working on, um, we were trying to find out whether this fairly uh, aggressive metal on metal um, technique could actually be adapted to uh, polymers. Um, and so we were able to develop a new process which was actually uh, applicable across a broad range of different polymers um, and then eventually we were able to translate that also into being able to spray films. Oh, come the wrong way. So the particles, the metal particles are actually embedded into the polymer using a supersonic um, spray process and so what you can see here on the left hand side is the robot that we use for the, the cold spray. You can just about see the uh, supersonic gun there. Um, in the top right photograph, you can see part of a, uh, a seismic streamer jacket and it's uh, on a lathe and it's being sprayed by the gun. And in the bottom right uh, photograph, what you can see is one of the accessories that we have on a seismic streamer, which is one of the, um, the fins that they, they use to help uh, lift the, the streamers up in the water and so there you can see that the uh, gun is rustering back and forth and actually embedding the, the coating into the polymer. So just a little bit of background about the cold spray process. 
Um, so conventionally, it's used uh, metal on metal, and so uh, this is often used to coat things with um, titanium um, to give uh, you know, much better wear resistance. Um, and so the way that it works is that above a critical velocity, the uh, metal particles are able to actually form really strong metallic bonds. When they impinge on the um, metal surface, then there's a deformation and the kinetic energy is converted to heat. And so they're able to form a good bond. Below the critical velocity, what will happen is that you'll end up abrading the surface and it'll work more like grit blasting. Um, and so what we were able to come up with by careful selection of the velocity and the heat and the materials was actually to come up with a way of using the cold spray technology to actually embed the particles into um, a polymer. And so here you can see some examples. Uh, the photograph on the left shows um, a couple of uh, typical sort of colex uh, uh, streamer skins. Um, and you can see that uh, on the bottom part of it, it's been uh, uh, sprayed with the uh, copper particles. Um, and the picture on the right shows that because these are all discrete particles um, and it's very much a surface process, we've managed to change the surface behaviour of the material without actually changing any of the underlying characteristics. So it's quite possible to still um, bend and flex the materials without causing any sort of delamination. So in the early stages of the experiment, uh, of the project, we actually looked at a number of different um, mixtures, a different, uh, different uh, copper, uh, copper alloys and different uh, metallic powders. Um, and they were all, uh, it, was, it was quite possible to spray all of them. We came up with, uh, you know, the conditions to, um, to be able to do that. Um, but the important thing was to determine which ones were going to be the most effective in a real environment. So we set up an experiment which ran for just over three years um, down at the uh, Queenscliff uh, Cruising Yacht Club in uh, Victoria. And the part of the, all the different samples, including some anti-foul paints, were set up on a large board. And the board was then suspended off the jetty. So there was some tidal flow. Um, and every month, Andrew would go down to the, um, roughly every month, Andrew would go down, um, retrieve the sample board, and then just give it a very light washing. So we didn't want to wash off any of the fouling. We just wanted to be able to remove any of the sort of incidental um, you know, grit and um, particles. Um, and what we found from that was that uh, although many of the metal samples performed quite well, actually the copper was probably the most effective one. Oh, I've done it again. So um, the photograph here you can see is actually a nylon plate. Um, and so the photograph on the right hand side um, you can see has been uh, coated um, with the uh, cold sprayed copper. And the color, it's gone green because an oxide has formed. Um, so it's quite typical for uh, you know, patina to form, so it will go green. And the uh, sample, that the picture that you can see on the left-hand side is actually the control sample um, after 519 days. So the photographs here um, are some experiments that we carried out um, looking at how this would actually behave on a streamer skin. And so what you can see again is that the, um, the parts of the streamer that have been coated um, have managed to uh, hold off the biofouling really well. And um, you can see that there's quite significant growth um, on the untreated part of the streamer. So after we had um, come up with that solution, uh, we actually licensed that to uh, an engineering company because the next, you know, CSRO is not in the business of, um, you know, providing coatings. And so we actually worked with a, um, a third party so that they would be able to come up with the engineering solution to be able to then take that technology out into the marketplace and to be able to coat the streamers when the ships came back to, um, uh, to a port where they were going to be doing maintenance or whatever. 
Um, and so we were then at the point where we had to decide, well, you know, what else do we do with this project? Are there any other applications that we can look at? And so at this stage, um, they were actually taking applications for the um, CSRO ON project, which is a, a sort of initiative where they're looking at taking sort of scientific um, projects and uh, trying to commercialise them, trying to get the scientists to understand how do you take technology to the market, how do we do innovation better. And so we were lucky enough that our team got selected, and so we spent 12 weeks on um, an, uh, a, a fully residential um, course um, where we were able to uh, meet with entrepreneurs and people in business and try to sort of figure out how we could take this technology um, to the market and to create impact in the real world. So some of the things that we looked at were um, whether we could apply it to um, aquaculture. So there were a lot of problems in aquaculture. Um, in the middle, you can see um, there's a lot of issues with prawn farming, um, a lot of biofouling problems. Um, we considered the oil and gas industry, um, but ultimately we decided that uh, we would look first at high value sensors. So there's a lot of oceanographic monitoring um, and some of our colleagues in Oceans and Atmospheres down in Tasmania um, sent us some of the photographs that you can see on the bottom and um, the far, the, the bottom left photograph is actually an acoustic current, um, ADCP, acoustic Doppler current profiler. And the picture in the middle is actually the same unit um, after three months in the Brisbane River. So after we had been in the program for about seven or eight weeks, and we had been trying to figure out what was our business model, how would we be able to commercialise this technology. The problem was that the um, equipment um, is quite, it, it's not trivial. You can't just hand hold and spray. You've actually got to have a nitrogen supply. You've got to have sort of fairly complex equipment. It's um, not cheap. So it would be something that you would either need to install at the end point of manufacture. So you need to find somebody who's manufacturing a lot of things that are the same, um, that are gonna go into the ocean, or um, we needed to be able to ship things to a facility so that we could then spray them and then we could send them back. So in trying to work through um, those sort of business models, we realized that you know, neither of those were very elegant and um, it was going to be very expensive and very difficult either way. Um, and then we sort of had this eureka moment where we had been speaking to people who'd been putting a lot of sensors into the ocean and what they were doing was covering them in duct tape. So while the duct tape didn't actually prevent any of the biofouling, it did make it a lot easier for them to clean it. And so we were kind of joking going, well, what we really need is sort of high tech duct tape. And eventually one day we said, you know, actually what we really need is a high tech duct tape. And so we weren't sure whether that was possible because cold spray is actually, you know, usually you, you would repair an engine. You build up metal on metal um, to try and repair things. Um, and so being such an aggressive process, we didn't think, we, we weren't sure whether it would be possible to actually take it to the level of spraying an adhesive film. Um, but anyway, we decided to give it a go. So we um, bought some, uh, you know, quite high performance polyurethane film that has got good UV resistance and it's got a good marine adhesive. And we um, went to back to the lab and we tried to spray some samples. And the initial few samples were just blown to pieces. They were just completely destroyed. Um, however, Peter being very tenacious was determined not to be um, you know, defeated. And after about five or six attempts, we actually managed to get something that looked like we were getting some copper embedment into the film without destroying the film. Um, we were then able to actually get funding when we came off of the 12-week the, the um, uh, on program. We were able to get funding to continue to try and commercialise it over the next year. And so we then built a prototype film feeder and we figured out how we could scale up the process. And in the meantime, we went back to the market to try and talk to people to see um, you know, where this solution could be applied. So what you can see now in this photograph is um, on the far left-hand side, you can see um, it's actually a copper 
you, you can buy copper tape. A lot of people that were um, wrapping up their sensors were using an adhesive copper tape, which is just a very thin copper foil. Um, so that sort of appeared to be our kind of closest direct um, competitor. But what people told us about that was the problem is that it actually the copper depletes quite quickly because as you can see in the photograph there, it kind of corrodes away and so a layer will slough off and then you'll get the clean copper um, exposed again and then that'll oxidise. And although it will be effective, what will happen is that over time all of the copper will flake away in quite you know, significant chunks. Um, and then what you're left with is a sticky layer which is actually much better for biofouling and is really, really difficult to clean off. Um, what you can see, or you can't see in the middle, is a control sample of our film um, before it's been sprayed with copper. And so you can see that that's almost completely disappeared. You can just about make out the, um, the edges, but that's completely covered in fouling. And on the right-hand side, you can see uh, one of our original patch um, samples. And so those have now been in the water for about uh, 15 months and they're still working um, really well. So it's, it's comparable with the experiment that we did before, which we stopped after three years. And now we're being able to get in about twice as much copper loading into those um, polymer samples. So again, you can see that now we can sort of spray this. At the moment, we're only looking at 300 wide sheet, but we're able to um, spray uh, you know, meters. We can now do this in sort of meters. Um, in talking to some of the uh, instrument suppliers, uh, the problem is that what we're trying to do is to cover a 3D shape um, with a 2D, you know, with a well, one-dimensional um, sheet. Um, so we looked at how we might be able to um, do some uh, CAD drawings and actually figure out how we might be able to do laser cutting and come up with some kind of stickers so that you could actually put them over complex shapes and that they would um, stay on fairly well. So we're working with a number of uh, instrument suppliers at the moment um, to see whether that's an effective solution uh, in their environments. We're also working with a, a company from uh, West Australia. Um, so they've got uh, some of our samples and they're actually deploying um, a number of rigs off the, the northwest shelf. So this was a really good opportunity with, uh, for us because we're actually getting it into a heavy fouling region um, with warmer water, different environment to see how well it's going to perform. Um, you can see that in, uh, we've, we've had uh, these samples now out for nine months, but you can see this particular sample, we'd taken a buoy and it had been cut up and then we'd sprayed the samples. So this was a direct embedment. Um, but it's the same treatment. And what you can see here is that all around the edges, which are um, untreated, you can see that there's um, a nice little colony of barnacles starting to grow. Um, but the, the surface, which has been uh, treated with copper, is still completely um, fouled, you know, unfouled. Um, and you can also see here um, th these were some of our film samples that we applied onto some plastic uh, coupons um, and when they retrieved these after four months uh, you can see again that the, uh, the samples, the, the film samples, there's been a slight, you know, they've changed slightly greenish colour um, but the control sample again is completely uh, encrusted with uh, barnacles. So basically to summarise, um, the, the, the product that we've come up with is a um, broad spectrum uh, anti-fouling solution. Um, it's very long lasting and we think that one of the reasons for this is that unlike the copper, um, which, which corrodes, essentially corrodes in the marine environment and then it gets pitted and lumps of copper fall off, um, because our solution um, is just individual particles um, the film itself is completely non-conducting and so um, we believe that that's one of the reasons why it's able to actually leach out very, very slowly and um, so that the surface remains effective, um, which should lead to the fact that, you know, it should be reducing, although it's effective at the surface, 
it will be um, putting less copper into the environment and certainly it won't be building up in sediments in the same way that when the copper sloughs up in, in lumps that it's possible for that to happen. Um, and also uh, one of the other advantages is that uh, it can be used in, in the field. So in a fairly uh, challenging environment, it's still possible because you need to spray the film. Um, it needs to be applied wet. Um, it could be applied underwater. We haven't actually done that, but it is possible, theoretically possible. Um, and it could be um, easily tailored to other end uses. So at the moment, we haven't actually looked at shipping. Um, we've been focusing on sort of smaller objects and trying to sort of prove it up in, um, yeah, in different environments. Um, but certainly, yeah, it's, it's an interesting question.